That's right, yeah. Okay. So I have to apologize that I won't be here on next Monday as planned. And the reason is that there were some urgent family things, you know, they have, uh, have to go home. They were unexpected. So the idea was uh, Filippo proposed it to replace my sort of lectures on Monday then by the research seminar that I'm sort of giving now this month, uh, you know, talking about the work that we have been doing recently. And uh, uh, in this sense, I want to talk about these programmable quantum simulators with atoms and iron and want to tell you a little bit of story where all of these ideas, I told you, well, we have simulators, we derived Hamiltonians and all of that sort of come together. And they come together in a very close way with the experiment. And uh, the topic of the talk is that we're using programmable analog simulators as sort of the, the playground, you know, for us as theoretical physicists and experimentalists provide us with this simulator, but we as theorists are allowed to program these things directly. You know, this was not possible, I don't know, 10 years ago, but today it is. And uh, learning about the large-scale entanglement was sort of the topic, and uh, let me start out by motivating this thing a little bit and then guide you through the different building blocks that we have developed uh, during the last few years, you know, um, that allowed us to do this uh, theory, you know, together with the experimental program. Um, so, when we talk about quantum simulation, I guess all of you know what we have in mind is a situation where we have um, some, maybe, for example, material or a many body system in general. And what we always do is that we write down Hamiltonians. I mean, this is the example of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian here. And then we are trying to solve uh, the corresponding Schrodinger equation, time dependent, time independent, whatever. And we can do that, of course, with classical computing, but in quantum simulation, we say that we can build. Analog simulators, these are the simulators that we have talked about uh, last time, where we engineer certain Hamiltonian physical in the lab. Or maybe also we can really program this, and this is the world of digital, or then at the end, and also hybrid quantum simulation. We'll see some of that now in the following. Uh, the hope, of course, that by doing this, we have some quantum advantage, under quote, uh, that you know, we are able to solve here, solve, again, under quote, problems. Uh, that are beyond what classical devices are able to do. That's sort of the selling point. And uh, of course, the, the main reason why this um, is true, or we hope it's true, or maybe true, is related to the fact that we have uh, entanglement in the system, so that the many-body wave function that we write over here uh, for these systems is really the superposition of uh, maybe a very large number of different configurations, and in the classical computer, you might not be able to store that. Uh, think of matrix product states that you have to cut off with some bond dimension, and of course, at the end, you would like to do it in, in higher dimensions, even though here we will only look for you know, reasons that we don't only have a quantum device in 1D, but do it for one dimensional problems. And so there's a very general sort of fundamental problem associated with all of these things here, and this is related to this fact can be learned and quantify large-scale entanglement structure for many-body quantum state, and maybe even do that in this regime of a quantum advantage where maybe classical devices fail. This would be, I guess, interesting to develop. And of course, experimentalists provide us with machines, you know, that they built along the lines that we explained last time a little bit. Uh, but what's sort of left on the theory side is to come up with protocols. So you have a machine there, you're able to make measurements, you're able to prepare maybe certain quantum states. I mean, how do we learn, you know, how do we devise protocols that allow us to, to learn this entanglement structure, the many body wave function, and I will make it a little bit more precise than uh, later on what I mean by that and what we actually would like to do is bipartite entanglement and uh, learning a, a Schmidt decomposition, for example, of some, some wave function. This will be our goal. So this is setting the stage, and I think that the question is uh, probably, in a sense of fundamental science, an important one. Um, now you might say, in general, that, well, learning, you know, if I have a bipartite system, you know, I have a many-body wave function, I split it into two parts. Uh, that uh, learning, for example, uh, doing a tomography and learning, for example, the Schmidt decomposition of your wave function is something that will be very expensive, as a matter of fact, exponentially expensive. And um, But I would like to point out that in the case that we consider here, namely quantum simulation, that these wave functions that we have over here are generated by Hamiltonians like the one over here. You can see this Hamiltonian uh, sort of seen from the perspective that these have this whole exponential Hilbert space has actually a very simple structure because it contains just two particle interactions over here and not five and not, I uh, don't know, 100,000 particle interactions. So Hamiltonians that we have in physics 
typically are what we call K-local Hamiltonians. And this locality or this simplicity of physical Hamiltonian, which underlies the fact that we are solving a physical quantum many-body problem, this thing is reflected, of course, also in the, in the entanglement structure of the wave function. And we'll see afterwards that this is what we are trying to use here, you know, uh, in order to come up with the characterization of this many-body uh, wave function entanglement structure in the way that we want. Okay, and the regime of large particle numbers. So I guess you're all already sort of experts now for programmable quantum simulators by having seen the derivation of the Hamiltonian. Let me now come back and tell you a little bit how you can play with these things in sort of this same experimental environments, you know, that we are allowed to program these experimental simulators and show you sort of in the first round just, you know, a few results of what we're able to achieve, like preparing ground states and looking at quench dynamics and, and all of these kind of things, setting the stage, okay? And then we'll afterwards talk about how do we want to measure that and develop, and this is sort of our theoretical task, uh, a toolbox for doing that, and over the last few years we uh, developed something that's called the randomized measurement toolbox. If you would like to read a review, uh, this was written up now uh, two years ago, one and a half years ago, and came out over here in Nature VV Physics. This is very readable, I think, and should contain also some of the main references uh, from early on. And then we will talk about things like, you know, how can we measure rainy entanglement entropy? This is something that we did again a few years back and was our first application, you know, that we can measure uh, entanglement via measuring the purity of the reduced density matrix of a, uh, of a system that, has, that we divide into two parts. Yeah. Okay, so from last time, you know that uh, we have this lab over here. Here's an ion simulator in the back. You know, basically what it comes down to is this. It's a string of ions. We can individually address them, prepare all of these winds and up and down. And uh, we can then switch on a Hamiltonian between these ions over here, which is the uh, Ising Hamiltonian down here. And to sort of summarize the physics, I mean, why is this uh, Ising Hamiltonian coming out over here uh, with these long-range interactions simply coming out from the fact that if you got a string of ions here and they spin up and spin down, uh, if, if you shine in laser, you can make a spin-dependent distortion of your crystal. Okay, so depending on what the spin configuration is, the crystal will have a different distortion. And this distortion energy in the crystal, one configuration relative to the other one, this gives you an energy, and this energy is basically the one which is the Hamiltonian that we're writing over here. So it has a very simple, intuitive, classical meaning, if you want, uh, but now it acts here as a, as a quantum Hamiltonian. Uh, the important feature in this Hamiltonian being the fact that it has long-range interactions, so it's really uh, one divided by R to some power alpha, and alpha is typically... 1.2 to say sort of a, a number in principle this is tunable, but this is something that experimentalists seem to, to like for whatever reason here. So that's a system that we would like to play with. And, uh, you know, at the end, we're going to do this now. This was sort of the new thing last year with 51 ions. You know, in earlier versions, it was only 20 or the 10 and so on. You can see the progress. Uh, of course, in Innsbruck, there's also now a trapped ion system that is 2D. Uh, which is more complicated than the 2D is very interesting by itself, but no experiments yet. But we would uh, we sort of expect that, you know, all of the techniques that I talk about here can be transferred, you know, to this 2D situation, which gets physically, I guess, much more interesting, of course, than the one that we are doing right now here. Uh, is it what interaction? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 that's right. I mean, uh, I have to say that, uh, honestly, nobody really quantitatively derived the corresponding Hamiltonian in all detail with the mapping out of the J, J and so on, matrices or so. Uh, but if I think about the problem, it's very clear that it is like that, and uh, there's some experimental evidence also. So there's some work to be done. I'm saying that's sort of what's going on right now. Okay, yeah, you're right. Yes? Uh, you are correct that over here, you know, this is the, the way that these things out here. So very often what the experimentalists do is that they leave out the outer ions over here. And in some other cases, uh, Chris Monroe, for example, puts in some effort in adding another potential 
as a correction to the whole thing beyond the harmonic oscillator potential to squeeze these things closer together. Uh, you will see, and actually uh, it's a very important point that you raise over here, you know, you will tell me, can we believe the Hamiltonian over here? How are we sure? You know, there's a very interesting topic which is called verification of a simulator, and there's this uh, topic, this could be an extra class almost here, on learning Hamiltonians from an experiment. I have a big system, and uh, can I learn the Hamiltonian back? And uh, when you do that, and we can in part, we are not talking about this thing here today, then you will find indeed there will be corrections of the type that you talk about. But at the same time, even though we don't know the Hamiltonian very precisely, what we will do in the following, you will see that we will prepare ground states now via a variational algorithm, and they turn out to be insensitive to this kind of us not knowing exactly what the Hamiltonian is. I come back to this point later. So that's a, an important and a good point here. Yeah. Okay, so let me now say, go quickly, what's kind of the, the obvious story right now, which is, uh, uh, namely, in early days, you know, when these things were first built in the lab, and this was, I don't know, 2014 or uh, going back a little bit, uh, uh, the motivation behind building such systems, you know, with these easing Hamiltonian in the traps, was simply that, well, you prepared a certain, uh, I don't know, pattern, spin up, spin down state of the ions over here, and then you looked at quench dynamics. The interesting part in the quench dynamics, of course, being that you can have an isolated system. You prepare it in a state, pure state, with very high fidelity. It's a product state. And of course, then you can observe your quench dynamics over here that basically converts the product state to an entangled state over here uh, in an isolated system. You can look at things like thermalization and all of these interesting things, uh, knowing, of course, that this Hamiltonian here is a non-integral system. So it becomes a very interesting playground right now. And uh, as I'm speaking now here, um, uh, Pasquale Calabrese is giving, I think, at length, as far as I know, a seminar right now about the member effect, you know, which is uh, sort of quench dynamics over here that was studied in these systems. But he had ideas that needed measurement of entanglement. So what I will tell you today, actually he will use and has used, you know, in these papers that are being published right now, you know, as a tool to measure entanglement. And I'm going to tell you the entanglement story per se and, uh, and not this member effect. Okay, and as I said before, you know, we can do measurements on the systems over here. So uh, we have a system here, and then we're doing a single shot measurement. And um, this keeps, is done with a certain probability. You measure certain bit strings over here. You can convert them to correlation functions, what uh, traditionally people in condensed metaphysics would do. Uh, but you can also do the following, namely uh, be aware of the fact that uh, when we do this quench dynamics, some of these early experiments also try to look at the entanglement properties, and it's probably best to explain to you just by hand what was going on here. Uh, this was operating this, uh, this easing Hamiltonian in one particular limit that seems to be experimentally the most stable one, which is the limit of a large magnetic field. Because in this limit of a large magnetic field over here, this uh, sigma x, sigma x part of the Hamiltonian, if you decompose it into sigma plus, sigma minus operators and you multiply it out, there will be a term sigma plus, sigma minus. These are the flip-flop terms in the Hamiltonian. Um, and there will be other terms, sigma plus, sigma plus. They are not energy conserving in the large magnetic field. So basically, this Hamiltonian then uh, switches over to an XY model, which is just flip-flop type interactions. Okay? And uh, one of the first experiments done in the context of quenching was uh, the following. It was a fairly detailed study at that point. So one had an, an iron string, uh, like up there, and all of the spins were down. And then you go there, you take the middle one, you flip it up here. And what will happen now with an XY Hamiltonian? Uh, so if this uh, spin is up over here, you know, this thing can either sort of hop to the right, you know, this uh, spin up, or it can also hop to the left. But suppose that at a certain time now, you start to look, uh, well, if you make a measurement and the spin here is up, you know, then the other over here must be down because you only have one excitation in the system and vice versa, you know, because you get a superposition of propagating left and right. So what you're generating here are bell pairs, you know, bell pairs are entangled. states so like, you know, that you get this plus this over here. And of course, you can see that and the experiments have revealed all of these things very beautifully, okay? This was one of the early demonstrations and these are these references here, the first one from Innsbruck, an experimental one, and the second one uh, from uh, the group of Chris Monroe at that time in Maryland. Okay, uh, but now we get sort of a little bit more greedy and say, well, you know, we can obviously generate entanglement. Huh? Uh, what is the family of entangled states that we can generate, you know, with these uh, kind of resources that we have over here? And uh, one way to look at the problem is like this, that, you know, when we have here 
a Hamiltonian like this, like the one that we're writing down here, is like being able to do an, uh, an n-body gate on your system. You know, normally we talk about C0, control node operations, phase gates, and all of these kind of things. Here we got something that works on a very large system scale, you know, 51 ions that we'll see in the following, and with very high fidelity, you're able to ma make an entanglement Hamiltonian, but this, uh, an, an entanglement with this Hamiltonian over here, uh, but of course, uh, you know, it has certain tunable parameters, but it's not universal quantum computing, okay? So what we can do here is sort of now the obvious play. We can, uh, you know, putting our toolbox together, we can entangle by just looking at the time evolution with this given Hamiltonian. Think about the XY Hamiltonian I just talked about. Then you might uh, put in another layer of uh, single qubit or single spin rotations, you know, in some form. Another layer of that, another layer of that, and in this form, what you're generating will be like a family of wave functions over here, where these are parameters, theta 1, theta 2, think of them, the times, how long you switch on these Hamiltonians over here, to build up then a family of wave functions, okay? Uh, this is not universal quantum computing I talk about over here, but you can generate, you know, pretty highly entangled wave functions over here. And um, at that point, you know, it's, uh, you may say, for what purpose? Well, you know, one purpose could be, uh, well, this is just writing out here what these uh, individual operations are. So these are the single qubit rotations down here, and this would be these entangling operations that we, as I said, we are in the limit usually of the sigma plus, sigma minus, these hopping terms over here, that's how we operate that. So it's not the universal gate set, but it's pretty scalable, and we want something now that's scalable, and we want to do quantum simulation, you know, in a, in a way for very large particle numbers, and large for us means 51, okay? But you can see where these things come in. I mean, there's some uh, old ideas around in quantum formation that are, from a theoretical physics point of view, pretty obvious, namely variational uh, methods, where you simply say that I'm able to generate in my Hilbert space you know, a very large class of highly entangled wave functions uh, that depend on certain parameters. Why not do something that all of us did in in quantum mechanics one lectures, you know, when we learned how to calculate approximately the ground zero of an, of an helium atom, you know, you wrote down an ansatz and then you were optimizing certain parameters and you can do the same thing over here. Uh, the advantage, of course, that you can do that in the, in the way where you got very, uh, a lot of entanglement. Uh, and you get away with that, of course, only if, you're, if the depth of your circuit over here is not too deep, because if you've got too many layers, then at one point you're dying from decoherence. And uh, so we can apply, I don't know, 10 layers or whatever, and uh, have a certain number of parameters then correspondingly over here. So uh, what you can do then is this, that you can perform your measurements, uh, but you can also then sort of do a quantum feedback. And uh, quantum feedback, for example, in the following way, that you can try to calculate the ground state of a Hamiltonian. So this should be understood in such a way that you have some Hamiltonian that maybe has nothing to do with the Ising model. That's very important to keep in mind. Okay, you write down a Hamiltonian, we'll now for the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. You know, we got an Ising Hamiltonian here, but uh, we will then apply or sort of try to learn the ground state or prepare the ground state of, an, of a Heisenberg Hamiltonian to study its entanglement property. So you write down on a piece of paper this entanglement, uh, this uh, uh, Hamiltonian over here, we call it the target uh, Hamiltonian uh, in the lattice model. It can be have one body terms, two body terms, three body or whatever you want. And we are going then to use the, the resource over here was our Ising Hamiltonian uh, uh, that we can switch on in these different ways, including rotations. And uh, then you might ask the question, you know, can we, for example, find, can we find here the, uh, an approximate ground state? Well, and uh, that's exactly what I said before, what you did in quantum mechanics in your, uh, in, um, in these early courses, uh, you would like to minimize this energy landscape over theta, theta is a high dimensional parameter. And uh, by being able to measure on a quantum device, the quantity on the right hand side, trying to minimize that, the minimization over the theta occurs, of course, on the, cla on, the, on, the, on the classical computer, you know, whereas these expectation values that you have over here will be worked out on the quantum device. Uh, and so what you have to measure on your quantum machine over here are that these expectation values, and then you're trying to minimize this thing, and the classical computer explores this energy landscape as a function of theta. So that's uh, exactly what you do in sort of standard variation principles. And um, the great thing about this is the fact that this is, um, that's coming back to your question here, robust to design errors in the, in the resource Hamiltonian, which was the Ising Hamiltonian. 
here. And uh, the reason is simply that uh, even if I build up a family of wave functions that do not know precisely what these Hamiltonians are in a many body system of 51 particles, this is quite obvious that this is, you know, there will be some small defects or some misplacements or whatever, some modulation that you pointed out, for example, here. Uh, nonetheless, you find over here the best wave function, you know, given your family that you generated on your device, and you do not have to know the detailed structure of your different bits and pieces of the resource Hamiltonian, because you're optimizing a target Hamiltonian. This is the one over here that you wrote down on this piece of paper, and where you asked your quantum machine to work out the different correlation functions for you. Okay? This is sort of the, the, the central idea. So this is very robust, and then you want to do that here. So uh, we did, you know, some some first sort of playing with this thing. Now a few years ago, and this was, uh, you know, this uh, this paper uh, written together with uh, Christine Meyer. She was an experimental uh, student in Rainer Platz Group. Uh, Christian Kokail, he is now at Harvard as a postdoc. He was a theory student, just left now uh, a few months ago. And Rick von Beinen, who was a senior postdoc. And you can see them sitting in the lab, and theorists are programming here, really, literally, the quantum device and trying to do this optimization. Yeah? Ah, okay. So you're saying that uh, here we talk about preparing a ground state. We say, can you also time evolve? Is this what you're saying? Ah, you want a, a time-dependent Hamilton? Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, you mean as the resource, you know, the, as the resource. Uh, uh, in, yeah, in principle, you got lasers, you know, and the lasers you switch on and off. I mean, when I said here that we switch on the Hamiltonian, it really means that you're turning a laser on, then the Hamiltonian is switched on, you know, uh, and then we leave it, the lasers left constant, then you switch it off, and then it's, uh, this is the time evolution. And what you're now simply saying is this, that uh, why not modulate the laser in between, uh, and you can do all of that, that's right, yeah. Uh, but in the way that we do it here, of course, the number of parameters to sort of discretize these things as, you know, plateaus, if you want, you know, is, is, is minimized here. And so it's the smallest number of parameters. You know. The main problem, what, what we do over here, and this is, of course, the sort of, at the end, always end of variational quantum uh, state preparation that we talk about over here, is this, that your classical computers, if you give them an energy landscape, uh, optimizing this energy landscape classically actually uh, becomes as a function of these parameters then very expensive. You run when the number of variational parameters is large into barren plateaus, how these things are called, and, and so on and so on. So all of this works really well if your variational circuits are short. You know, if you make them too long, then uh, you're calling for, for trouble. But we'll see in the following, we get away with very short circuits. And uh, so we yeah, are quite happy at the moment with what we do here. Yep. Well, uh, I sort of know the circuit, you know, because I, uh, uh, what the machine gives me back, the classic computer that prints out the, the values, you know, the first variational parameter, the first time how long is switching on was this, 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 this. So for me, I know the parameterization of my quantum circuit. Okay? So the computer gives me back theta. And theta is a prescription how to, to run this circuit over here, you know. Uh, and uh, so I have a description of the quantum state in terms of these angles that the machine gives me, okay? Uh, if you want the uh, classic computer to print out the quantum state, no, it won't do that. But I have a prescription in terms of the circuit over here. And uh, at the end, what we need is we want, uh, you know, this uh, highly entangled state to be stored in quantum memory on the device and play with that, okay? Uh, so... Uh, in some sense, this is what we don't want, that we print it out, you know, we want it uh, to be stored in quantum memory because uh, then we can afterwards analyze it, like analyze what are the entanglement properties and reveal these properties. This will be the game at the end. Okay, so uh, this was the, the early days and you can see this was now at that point, you know, this was 1919. Uh, he wrote this paper, it was called Self-Verifying Variational, and this was the time when we developed all of these tools behind it. And there's a lot of sort of interesting problems that uh, have to be solved over here. 
uh, I'll just show these, these old slides from over here. So what we did at that point was that we had here, uh, uh, okay. We took uh, a lattice model, uh, a Schwinger, you know, one-dimensional quantum electrodynamics, and you can convert this thing to a very ugly spin model over here. We show this spin model then to our classical computer that optimizes then the corresponding cost function over here. This was, in these old days, this variational cooling down here and preparing a certain state. And the exciting thing at that point was, of course, well, okay, what we had to develop is this classical optimization. There's a lot of things to be learned. The main problem being that, you know, when you run a quantum machine, uh, you have to repeat the experiment many, many times. So you, you have shot noise in the whole thing. So it's really optimization is something which is a noisy landscape. And how do you do all of that? There's a lot of things to be done, a lot of things to be learned. But uh, uh, Rick van Beiner was the main person who developed certain uh, protocols, classical protocols over here for do that. And uh, this is the one that you use, and I'm not going to explain them. The exciting thing at that point was that we had the self-verification. We could also measure on the quantum machine the variance of the state that we prepared. You know, ideally, if this was an eigen state, this variance should be zero. Okay, but uh, if it's not, it's telling us. Uh, of course, you know what the corresponding error bar is, and we could show that this error bar in the cooling down here was smaller than the distance to the first excited state that we could also prepare and measure. So the quantum machine prepared the ground state, gave us a number, the excited state you know, gave us a number, and we were able to measure the variance and saw that this variance is smaller than the distance to the first excited state. There's a finite gap, of course, because it is a finite system. Okay? But it's amazing that this worked okay, a few years ago on the 20 machines. So, uh, let me now show you what, uh, what we've been doing now uh, essentially last year or since one and a half years, I have to say. And this is just this, this paper that came out and I'll talk, talk about the entanglement part later. We are still in this more technical uh, part of our whole discussion over here. Uh, you know, so what we said uh, is this. Uh, can we, for example, prepare a ground set of a target Hamiltonian with our easy resource? which is the Heisenberg model over here. The Heisenberg model is kind of interesting because you can see this is this uh, XXC model here of a spin one half. That is a function of this uh, delta over here. It has uh, a critical uh, phase and, and, and also a critical point, and there's uh, a gap phase over here. So we would like to prepare ground states, or I should say approximate ground states, in these regimes over here, and these variational tools is sort of a cheap way for us of getting pretty good ground states in this case. And I want to show you what comes out. Um, you know, again, we have here some circuit. I'm not going to explain how this is done. This is five layers and 10 parameters that classical computers can optimize. They are intentionally very short because this is a long string, so there may be some decoherence. And uh, what you find at the end is this, that yeah, you can cool down. You're not going to the ground state. That would be the energy down here, the dashed line. Uh, but it actually turned out, when you run these short circuits, we see from MPS, uh, simulations that uh, you basically get that the approximate ground state that you prepare in a machine is about the superposition of the 300 lowest lying states that you have in your Heisenberg model. 300 sounds a lot, but don't forget that this is 2 to the 51, you know, 2 to the 51 is pretty big, 10 to the 14. So 200, so uh, basically in this energy range you know, between the ground state and then the maximum and so on, we are in the regime of a few percent down here. If you convert that to temperature, this is not a thermal state, okay? This is really a coherent superposition. But if you convert it to temperature, this is a very, very low temperature that we prepared here. It's not the ground state, but it is something that's, yeah, good, good enough for us, okay? So we are able to do that, and I'm sort of at the end now of my, um, how should I put it, um, you know, technical part, you know, that simply shows us that we can prepare ground states in the systems over here, in a sense that I said, you know, these uh, few low-lying states. And what we're going to ask now is this, um, can we now uh, use this, these tools, um, in order to do something interesting? Um, and uh, there's sort of, on one hand, this uh, basic quantum science part, and the thing that we've been interested in is this learning of the entanglement. Uh, here's a theory paper that uh, laid out the protocol, and this is now the experiment that, was, uh, that appeared now last year, end of last year. Or you can also then find applications. I will not talk about the second part here. You can think, and this is a, I think, important application, to use the same tool set, namely this variational to do quantum metrology. That's a separate part over here by itself. I'm not going to speak about it over here. If you want to ask me afterwards, I can tell you uh, where you can use the same variational circuits, for example, to optimize 
a ramp center from it to generate entanglement, to generate the best entanglement for quantum metrology that includes uh, here specific uh, metrological cost functions that are tailored to an atomic clock, so to make atomic clocks, clocks better and so on. So I speak about the first part over here. And uh, what the theorist now has to do is this, uh, how do we come up with protocols? I've in quantum memory, my beautiful entangled state, and I would like to find now out, you know, what the entanglement properties are. And uh, how, do we, how do we do that in the way that the experimentalists don't uh, kick us out from their office, you know, <laughs> because they cannot do that, okay? Um, and so I'm now here at this point characterizing entanglement, and I should show you a few slides here, and I'm sure that many of you know these things in, in all detail, um, but let me, so this is maybe more a reminder for you, and then a sort of a definition of what we would like to, to measure at the end. Uh, so, uh, suppose that I prepared, uh, you know, here a state Psi and assume this to be the ground state or an approximate ground state that we just talked about over here. Then we can, of course, define a reduced density matrix by taking some region A that we have over here, um, you know, and the complement would be this region B. So, if we trace out the B in the spin system here, we get the reduced density operator. And uh, the reduced density operator, you might take measures of entanglement, and this will be the the first iteration of our discussion in the following. Um, you know, the most simple version would be, well, uh, if you look at the purity of this density matrix, uh, if it's less than one, then it's an indication of being entangled, uh, because uh, if it's uh, not entangled, it would be a product state, C A tends to C B. And uh, in this case, of course, this thing would be one. And if this is less than one uh, in this period over here, then this would indicate the fact that we have here uh, uh, a mixed state. And this would be a study of rainy entropies, um, uh, uh, entanglement entropies as a function of system size and whatever we can do. Uh, you might say that, well, maybe more interest is to do the same thing for the von Neumann entropy. We will measure that also afterwards, but sort of using, uh, you will see how, namely by measuring the entanglement Hamiltonian to an entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. So this is what we are after. So how to measure? Well, and the answer will be randomized measurements, as you will see. And, uh, but of course, I also would like to remind you that by uh, looking at this, this uh, uh, what we call here the Schmidt decomposition uh, uh, in a bipartite way in, in A and B parts over here, um, if the Schmidt decomposition you know, has uh, only one term, this would be a product state. If chi is larger than one, then it would be an entangled state. So chi is basically the rank. And everybody who does matrix product states, of course, know this at the end is related to the to the bond dimension that you have. And uh, when you do classical simulations in the 1D systems, then you would like to cut off this bond dimension as early as possible and so on. So uh, we would like now, uh, so in, in, in doing uh, all of that over here, but we can ask the question, you know, would uh, I be able in an experiment, I give you in quantum memory a wave function, are we uh, able to measure the Schmidt decomposition, you know, and really see sort of the Schmidt decomposition if you want life, okay, like in the, in the case of quench dynamics uh, uh, here. And we'll see that we'll be able to do that in the following, okay. Okay. Um, there's, an, there's another way of uh, rephrasing, of course, the problem with this row A over here. Um, uh, which is that, you know, if I would like to, to measure, for example, or if you would like to do the Schmidt decomposition and write that down, uh, you might say that, well, what we have to do at the end, uh, this will be super expensive, it doesn't really work, is to simply do a tomography of this reduced density operator over here. But for the following discussion, it turns out that it is much better to rewrite this as this exponential of what we call the entanglement Hamiltonian that sort of looks like a, a mixed uh, Gibbs state ensemble, you know, with this Hamiltonian H tilde up here. This is the entanglement uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, of course, you know, the, uh, the Schmidt vectors that I wrote down on the last slide, they are of course just the spectral decomposition of this entanglement Hamiltonian over here. And these coefficients that we had out in front over here, they were just the corresponding entanglement spectrum. So you might say, can we measure the entanglement spectrum, you know, of a, of a reduced density matrix uh, in our system? or can we then also you know, find maybe the corresponding eigenvectors over here? These are things that we would like to, to answer by making corresponding measurements on the next mental device here. And can we do that in a sample efficient uh, way? So it has to do with the scaling with the, with the subsystem size that we have over here. Okay? And I always like to show this quote here from, uh, from Duncan Haldane, you know, that 
you would like to do all of that, for example, just the, the entanglement spectrum is something that he invented uh, in a famous paper. This was related to this Lee Haldane conjecture. If you know, it's a fingerprint of topological order. Low-lying entanglement spectrum can be used as a fingerprint to identify topological order. And I can only say that, well, in some of these systems, and uh, that's a 1D system, so it's a little bit trivial here, but in, in 2D, the same protocol would be, be applicable, so one is able in the future to measure entanglement spectra. And this is, I guess, something that is an interesting interface between these engineered quantum devices and the study of uh, you know, exotic or topological states of matter. That's sort of the motivation, and uh, let me now give you an, an example, and I'm doing this example, I will be a little bit ahead of what we will do now in the following, but just to indicate to you, uh, you know, in the context that I said earlier, uh, of the quench dynamics, um, uh, you know, what the outcome would be and what we would like to see and what the underlying physics is. So I said before that uh, let's think about the quench dynamics with ions. We prepare initially a product state, so, you know, spin up, spin down. We apply, for example, our, our Ising Hamiltonian, and you got quench dynamics, and then you stop at a certain point, and you say, what are the entanglement properties, okay, of the corresponding state? This will be a pure state, so we can ask, essentially, you know, what is the Schmidt, Schmidt decomposition? Can we see how the Schmidt decomposition changes as a function of time, that the bond dimension or the, you know, this cut of chi that we introduce will change from a product state, which was one, then grow, 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 and uh, we would like to see all of that in a, in a real experimental setting to a highly entangled state. And of course, we will do that by uh, looking at the subsystem A over here. The subsystem A density matrix can be parameterized in terms of this entanglement Hamiltonian. And the reason for looking at the entanglement Hamiltonian now in the following is that uh, it turns out in a many body system that very often the entanglement Hamiltonian is a much simpler structure than looking at the density matrix per se. Okay? Uh, and this is related to the fact that I said before that you got K-local Hamiltonians in a many-body system, and this sort of simplifies the problem or allows us, as you will see now in the following, to, uh, to develop efficient algorithms uh, for that. Um, and we can test if it's true or not, as you will see. Okay? So, in other words, you know, if you might ask over here, when we have this time evolution from the initial product state to this highly entangled state, uh, can we measure this uh, Schmidt decomposition over here? And the particular the Schmidt values here, and you can see that these are these coefficients over here. So, in the Schmidt decomposition, at the very beginning, at time equal to zero, uh, chi is equal to one. There's only one term over here, so this means that all of the Schmidt values, one of them will be one, and all the other ones will be zero. So, what we would like to see now is this, that when we do our quench, you know, uh, there's one, uh, one, and then zero, and how these things sort of sort of go up, uh, going eventually in the long time limit to something like a thermal state. Now, I have to point out right away that the thermal state we can never reach completely. The reason is that uh, there will be decoherence coming in from the outside. Decoherence in the systems is on the level of about percent level, you know, a few percent, one percent or something like that. And so you have to stop in time because otherwise the system will be, you know, defacing due to some external noise that you have. Okay, but can we see that? And uh, uh, the answer is uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, here are some theoretical simulations that if you take here a system of, I think it was 10 ions is in its case over here, and you take a, a bipartition, and this is from this uh, Nature Physics paper now a few years ago, uh, you can see that indeed uh, this uh, uh, Schmidt value, uh, lambda alpha, at the beginning one is one over here, uh, the, uh, all of the other ones are zero. This is the indicator of the fact that we got a product state at the very beginning. And if I switch on my quench, you know, you can see now that all of these other Schmidt values are going up. This is a theoretical calculation over here, uh, you know, and, and so on. And this would be a fit at the end to an eigen, uh, 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 when we do an entanglement Hamiltonian tomography, we'll not comment. And this would be the corresponding for Neumann entropy. So the protocols that we will talk about in the following, what they achieve in this thing over here is this. These are experimental data taken from the experimental device and using our protocol to extract all of these things. And I just want to sort of point out as a, as a warm up problem here that it's quite amazing. You can see a time equal to zero. Well, we are not exactly at one up there. Uh, why? The reason is some imperfections and decoherence, but you can see how these uh, uh, points that we have over here uh, they were measured at, you know, one, two, three, four, five different times. 
how they match extremely well this entanglement spectrum. So this is an example of getting the entanglement spectrum in quench dynamics from a real experiment out by, by measurement protocols. So this is, I think, achieving something that um, it was not uh, entirely obvious, at least to me, uh, some, some years ago. So this is really seeing how the Schmidt values change as a function of times in the, in the quench dynamics. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things here to be asked. And uh, by the way, by knowing, of course, here uh, at that point uh, in our protocol what uh, the corresponding density operates, which is parameterized in terms of an entanglement Hamiltonian, we can then also find what the agreement is uh, with the uh, with the von Neumann entanglement entropy, and these are corresponding points up here. There's a lot of details here that I don't want to discuss, like you know how do we analyze some of these experimental data that our experimental friends give us that have to do with uh, applying some, you know, uh, there's some defacing and measurement errors and how we deal with that and uh, they have to apply certain channels and so on. Uh, but these um, defacing and all of that is on the order of a few percent and uh, I think we have them under control and this is maybe more technical. Uh, I think the main message is clear. We can see here uh, the time evolution of, uh, of the Schmidt uh, decomposition life in the quench dynamics. Uh, these are some further comparisons now of these eigenvalues and so on, the different types. Amazing agreement, actually, I would say. Uh, but let me now sort of go back and start to talk a little bit about uh, how do we measure the Rainy entanglement entropy. This is some work that we did uh, some time ago by this randomized measurement toolbox. So I would like to slowly build up now how we approach these problems in these uh, actual um, experimental devices uh, over here, how to do that. So, um, Measuring Rainy entanglement entropy. So what we are after would be that, uh, for example, this is the most simple example, and this is the one historically that we did first, is that I got my system over here, A and B, and uh, I would like to measure a quantity like trace of rho A squared, the squared of the density matrix, because this is the purity and this is the Rainy entropy n equal to. How do we do that? I want to emphasize that this is not like a normal expectation value because it is a nonlinear functional of the density matrix. Um, whereas, of course, what you can measure in the lab is always linear functions of the density matrix. Okay, uh, we'll see afterwards that we can take copies of systems and so. But this is now part of the discussion that will now come. Okay, so uh, how do you approach this problem? Sort of a zero order version of the whole thing would be to simply say, oh, we can do tomography. Okay, I invite you to do that because uh, then your PhD might never end. Okay, because these systems at the large are, you know, exponentially expensive. Uh, so quantum state tomography, yes, it is an answer, but they are expensive. And of course, they're expensive in the sense uh, that, you know, it is the rank of row A. So even if it's a pure state, it scales exponentially with the subsystem size. So if you look at our subsystems, and in the following, we will look in some cases at subsystems of 51 ions of 20 particles. You know, this, uh, uh, this is pretty tough and hard. Okay. But there's one way out of this whole thing over here. This is the small print that you can see is expensive. Uh, but suppose that you know something about uh, your quantum state, okay? Something that you can test maybe in the experiment, but it might be true, and so you can verify your assumption and so on. Uh, and I want to convince you now the following, that if you're doing many body problems, uh, you know, with K-local interactions, we know something about it, namely that we had K-local interactions, like most of these uh, sort of natural many-body Hamiltonians, they have these kind of properties. So the idea is now that what do we know about the uh, system? Well, we got a uh, quantum simulation problem with K-local Hamiltonians. Uh, can we use this knowledge in order to come up with a protocol that is then uh, uh, sample efficient or sort of you know, allows us to, to go beyond that? This will be the, the goal in the following. There's another protocol that uh, we worked on very early, and there's a whole series of papers, and there was also experiments. Um, uh, the iron people had a very hard time doing that, and this is, you know, uh, based on complaint by my iron friends that could not do that. Uh, we switched over to these randomized measurement protocols, uh, which is the following that, you know, I suppose that I'm able to prepare two copies of my quantum state over here, this one and this one here. <laughs> that are identical. And in the lab, you can do that. We even have ways of testing the, uh, to what extent they are identical or not. Uh, in this case, uh, what you can do is that you can always write this trace of rho a square as a trace of a swap operator over here, uh, which is, you know, the physical state over here would be really rho a tensor rho a. And it turns out that the expectation value of this swap operator here 
uh, is basically this rainy entropy. So this means if you got copies of a quantum state and uh, you're able to switch on a quantum link over here, and this is what the trapped ion people cannot. If they build an ion trap over here and over here, it's very hard to connect them. You know, they cannot do that. Uh, so uh, you can come up with the protocol. And this is sort of the short derivation that I call it here V. This is the, the swap operator. If you go through this uh, multiplication, you can see this has to convert this tensor product by swapping indices basically into the row one um, times row two operator. Okay, if you go through that, then this is basically what it does. Uh, this can be done. Okay, but of course, over here, what you need to do is that you have to implement and measure this swap operator. We wrote papers about that, that they are uh, listed here below. And there was a beautiful experiment um, in the in the Greiner group that employed this protocol. So I was there visiting, and uh, I was able to convince them, together with Hannes Pichler, who is really the main contributor to this work here, I would say, together with Andrew Daly, uh, that uh, they should do the experiment where they took uh, both ions and condensate, uh, produced a mod insulator superfluid in the lattice, and uh, initialized it over here, did some quench dynamics, and then were able to measure the entanglement properties uh, over here. This was some time ago, but uh, I have some. I could show you some details how this works, but I'm not going to do it uh, now here. Uh, but there's another thing, and this is now uh, now we are coming to the randomized measurements. How we initially thought about this whole problem. So uh, when I talked to Rainer Platz, he said, "Oh, can we use maybe two iron traps and play some tricks?" He always said, "No." Okay, so once experimentalists say three times no, then you know that uh, you have to be inventive. And uh, so if you, uh, we sort of thought, well, if, uh, if Rainer doesn't like uh, real copies, maybe he likes virtual copies. And uh, okay, uh, and the idea of vertical copies is sort of like, like a replica trick that all of you know is simply to say that I got a single system over here and I can make myself a virtual copy, you know. And we'll see now on the next slide what I mean by these virtual copies uh, in order to measure this thing here. And uh, I emphasize always that, you know, the star over here in contrast to real copies in, in quantum mechanics that you cannot clone. Uh, virtual copies are allowed, as you will see now in the following. And, uh, and this is from looking at statistical correlations between random measurements where the signal is the noise. And uh, this was work in the thesis of Andreas Elven and Benoit Vermeersch was the postdoc in Innsbruck that uh, mainly worked on this topic. So let me tell you now what the ideas and some initial ideas along these lines were in an old paper by Stephen van Enck and Carlos Benacker. Uh, but I think uh, we converted this thing into something that uh, really works in the, in the lab. But the basic ideas are sort of underlying it are as follows. And to some extent, that's uh, you know, really quantum information stuff you talk about over here. So what do we do? Suppose that I have here uh, the re uh, region A, and row A is my reduced density operator. And I got the couple of spins in there. And I would like to uh, measure now the Rainy entropy, you know, entanglement entropy corresponding to this reduced density operator. So the protocol sort of works like this, that you got your density operator row A. But uh, now what you do is this, uh, that you apply here a random unitary to this whole thing over here. This random unitary can be a global one, acting here on the three spins that you can see, taken from a circular unitary ensemble, as one example. Could also be local uh, unitaries. You know, local ones are the ones that experimentalists like much better, because they're very easy. You just go with the laser that I mentioned earlier to first, second, and third, and make your random rotation that you can program, and so on. Uh, and, uh, uh, suppose that after that you start making measurements, and of course when you make the measurements after making this random rotation, so it's like measuring in the in the random basis to some extent, you get now a bit string out, okay? And this uh, bit string essentially corresponds to these probabilities that are written over here, row A, uh, the random unitary left and right, and then the bit string is the SA over here. So this is the corresponding probabilities, and you can see that these probabilities here depend, of course, on the unitary that they applied over here. So um, when you take the average of a circular unitary ensemble of all of these random unitaries, of course, what we'll, you will find is something which is very uninteresting, namely the fact that all of them, if you've done a good job, will be equal and just a constant. But the interesting part is that if you uh, take the random probabilities, square them, and then you take the average over the random unitary ensemble, that you get something that on the right-hand side you can see shows up here as the trace of rho a squared, but that's exactly the rainy entropy that we wanted. Okay, so you can see that, uh, uh, and let me tell you how this comes about. 
Uh, this is now this, why we call it virtual copies. You know, if I write down the P of U as A squared, and then I average over the random unit area. So this average, the bar over here, is a classical average, okay? The probabilities are quantum. So you get a quantum system, apply the quantum unit area to the whole thing, get your classical probabilities, you square them, and then you average over the different U uh, over here, okay? And you can see now that I can write down the P simply twice and put it under one trace. So it's like having, uh, because there's a PU squared over here, it's like the trace of a one, system one plus a two. This is exactly the two copies if you want to. So I can rephrase this probability, just taking the formulas for, from up here, insert them here, like a UA rho A UA dagger tensor, and then the second one. So this looks like having two copies available over here. And if I'm doing the averaging here, then you can see that it has the structure. This is very similar to, to having Gaussian averages. It's not the same, really, because it's circular unitaries here uh, uh, from the unit ensemble. Uh, then you get these cross terms and individual terms, and there's this term over here that at the end uh, shows up as a swap operator, and this is exactly the Rainy entropy. So to cut the long story short, you know, uh, if you take a system, and you apply random unitaries, you measure bit strings, and then you square probabilities and you average, you get rainy entropies out. So um, our initial papers along these lines were such that we said, well, uh, we have to do maybe, and this is what I'm writing here, this whole trick of by being able to apply global random unitaries on this subset over here. But again, if you talk to your experimental friends, they tell you that they don't like global because this would mean programming quantum circuits, and again, I mean, this is, okay. So they said right away, oh, uh, can you do that maybe with a, with local random unitaries? And uh, indeed you can, and Andreas Elben was the one that uh, provided uh, the answer, so that uh, the unitary over here is now local random unitaries applied to the different spins that you have over here, okay? And I'm not going to derive it here because you can find that, you know, in these papers uh, that I quote down here. Basically, what it means is this, that if I have uh, probabilities that I measure that correspond to a certain bit string and I'm cross-correlating these probabilities and I'm using a formula here, this is the distance between these different bit strings over here. I got an estimator here, uh, which then in, the expect in expectation gives me the Rainy entropy. Okay, the derivation is a little bit complicated. You can find it over here. I can never do it right now. So the answer is, uh, you can see that we have a single system, but uh, by applying random unitaries, where you think that you mess up the system completely, if you cross-correlate you know, these probabilities in a certain way, you're able to get stuff out, which is very interesting, namely the entanglement entropy in the sense of Arrhenian entropy, okay? Uh, and this is now the tool that in the following we are going to use and, and sort of expand, and uh, we'll see that it works uh, amazingly well. Uh, um, there's also, yeah, okay. Uh, maybe I'll skip this thing over here. This is the purity then, you know, what the corresponding formula is uh, for that, okay. So let's do right away that I want to show you how this works. So this was historically for us the, the first example where we simply said, okay, well, the experimentalists, they have this uh, XY model over here with the long range interaction with the transverse field. You know, this is shown on the left hand side over here. What do we get? So 10 ions, and now we're going to see for a subsystem of one, two, three, four, all the way to the total system of 10, I would like to show you what these rainy entropies are and how they evolve in the quench dynamics. So what would you expect for the uh, purity at time equal to zero? It is a product state. And if I take a subsystem, you know, all of these different rainy entropies as a function of subsystem size, each of them should be one, okay? So what do we get? Okay, well, it's not entirely one, but, you know, pretty, pretty close. So this is essentially, you know, just measurement errors over here. And uh, if you see here, the total purity for the total system, this was 10 ions, turned out to be 0.76 in the measurement that includes all of the preparation and measurement errors and all of that. Uh, this is supposed to be one over here, but you know, it's quite okay, yeah? And now let's go on and let's now look at the time evolution from the system here, you know, taking different times. At that point, you start to entangle, okay? And what you would expect is this, that if I take the total system, and I look at the purity of the total system, which should stay one or, well, 0.76, okay? But if I uh, bipartition the system here, then I would expect that the rainy entropy should be uh, by far less. 
So we would uh, sort of expect kind of a bell-shaped curve here that evolves from something which is one to something that becomes like this and sort of goes down. And this is exactly what you can see. And this is uh, measurements comparing also then with the theory. And you can see that indeed uh, the for the total system, it stays really the same. So, you know, a pure state stays a pure state to the extent that the coherence is not here. Uh, the rest is then this kind of a bell-shaped curve. And uh, this is done theory, including a little bit of decoherence. Uh, and uh, you can then see here the Rainy entropy, which is then, you know, total thing over here. Rainy entropy is taking the logarithm of the whole thing. And so you get, uh, can see that this is supposed to be flat. And these are these bell-shaped curves. And the, the literature is full. Uh, and uh, Andreas Leuchli, I think, has done the uh, earliest calculation about these things here. But now we see it live in the experiment, OK? Uh, and you can look at all the subpartitions, decide that they are entangled. You can look at these page entropies because we got a pure state and so on. I will not do that and simply say that if you add this order to the system, we were hoping that you could see somehow that there would be a logarithmic growth of this entanglement entropy, but the system could only be observed for too short time. So we saw that it was flatter. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, we couldn't really do that completely, but there was very clearly, you know, if you add this order. So at that point, you got the tool available and you can study whatever you want. You know, you can measure entanglement and rainy entropies. Uh, so the versions of the whole thing that are maybe very interesting because, uh, you know, we can at that point construct protocols that are uh, uh, comparing two quantum devices. And I think that that's a very interesting thing. And there's been some experimental papers also. So imagine that somebody builds a quantum symbol over here, and somebody builds another one over here. They trapped ions to say a good example, you know. And then you might say, do these uh, quantum simulators produce the same result? And I only allow you to have a classical link between them and not a quantum link. Uh, um, and uh, the, the way how we might be able to compare it is that I look at this overlap of trace A1, uh, A2, the overlap of the two density matrix and uh, look at can we measure this fidelity you know and uh, so this is uh, so we would like to compare the density operator the first and the one with the second system subsystem with a certain link over here and it turns out that the same kind of protocols that we developed over here also work uh, this is a cross-platform verification of quantum devices uh, and uh, we were sort of hoping that uh, this might be you know, uh, taken up by the community that people build their different quantum devices that claim to simulate this and that model. Uh, why don't they upload their, you know, corresponding data from this uh, randomized measurement? They can immediately compare their quantum machines, you know, uh, who is best. But some experimentalists don't want to compare, I sort of realize their quantum machines directly because one of them always feels that they are then the loser. And uh, so I didn't take this uh, psychology into account. But uh, I think it's interesting, you know. Uh, uh, one remark over here, so uh, I was complaining about exponentially expensive at the very beginning. Is this exponentially expensive? And the answer is, it is exponentially expensive, but much more friendly than tomography. Because if you look at this growth with the subsystem size of the number of measurements that you have to overdo, that, that you are able to do over here, then it turns out that it sort of scales exponentially, but the exponential is a very soft one. So it is not the solution for huge systems, but all of these ideas work for systems that are relatively large. And this will be, I think, important also now in the following. So, uh, the copy measurements are in principle better, but if you don't have it, uh, you can still do all of that over here. Mixed state entanglement, maybe I skip this thing over here. So let me now uh, say a few slides about these randomized measurements. Uh, there were these papers by Robert Huang and uh, John Breskill and uh, Richard Kung uh, that came out in 2020. It's called uh, Predicting Many Properties of Quantum Systems from Very Few Measurements. Uh, and they came up with these classical shadows. We had the randomized measurements and somehow uh, these two things here are very, very uh, related, okay? And uh, we wrote the review together. So if you want to see all of that written from one perspective, then uh, you might, uh, might read that. Uh, so we were the ones that developed these protocols and immediately went to the machine and, and applied it and, and have re reused data different times. And uh, what I mean over here by this uh, measure first and ask questions later is this, what happened actually that in this rainy entropy measurements, you know, there was, was a data set around, you know, that was measured simply there. It turned out that afterwards we got more and more clever and it allowed us not only to measure rainy entropies, but also the entanglement spectrum. 
you know, but the uh, data were here, so if you have enough data, you can be clever afterwards, you know, measure first and then think later, or now, sorry, ask questions later, you know, how to extract from your data something much more general, you know. And this has happened over a few years over here, and I, uh, this was quite amazing for us to see. So what's the idea behind this randomized measurement sort of in general? We have here quench dynamics and these random unitaries that could either be circular unitary ensemble uh, on a global scale or maybe then also on the local scale. And uh, the general principle is always like this, that you got probabilities out that you store for a certain you know, sample of, of unitaries where you run the experiment. And then you look at these classical cross correlations over here. So this could be an experiment on day one in lab one, an experiment on day two in lab two, or maybe the same one and so on. And uh, many of the quantities of interest in many body physics can be measured and expressed over here. And it's really, this uh, relies on the two design properties of these uh, random uh, unitaries that we have here. Here's a series of papers. And I think in the meantime, it's incomplete. And uh, right now, uh, Asquale is giving in length this seminar about the member effect, which is another application of all of that. Huh? Uh, so this is the one with the local ones that I just you know, explained to you now here before. And uh, let me just uh, mention now here that uh, you can also uh, get uh, uh, the complete density matrix out from the whole story over here. But of course, once you get from randomized measurement to complete density matrix, this becomes again a protocol which is as bad as the original tomography. But it will show you now uh, a version of this whole thing. And this is sort of our latest paper in this context uh, that, that just came out here, where we explore the large scale entanglement now uh, by preparing approximate ground states in the Heisenberg model. Heisenberg model and the ground state at the critical point is, uh, can be described by a conformal field theory. Conformal field theory has, makes predictions for the structure of the uh, of the reduced density matrix. You know, in terms of this piscinianer wichmann theorem, uh, it was uh, Marcello Dalmonte who pointed this out to us actually first when he was still a postdoc in Innsbruck. Uh, and uh, this provides us now with the knowledge that we say, oh, is conformal field theory right? Can we see that this uh, provides us with a clever answer that we can verify, but also measure? And this is the story I would like to tell you now. So. This is now making connections with conformal field theory here, uh, trying to see some of these things uh, in the lab. And of course, it would get really interesting once you do these things for, for higher uh, dimensions and not only just in 1D systems where we can compute all of that classically. Yeah. No, I mean, if I, uh, we sort of said uh, in the lecture yesterday, I guess, yeah, that if I give you a spin one half system, you know, uh, what you ask me is this, uh, what is the laser bias that I have to apply, you know, when you switch it on in intensity and off, but there will also be phases that sort of in the, if I think about the block sphere, you know, the expectation value of your spin that you generate, that I sort of produce a random state in, in all different directions. But this is just laser control, okay? So this is just switching on lasers with corresponding modulations. Yeah. Experimentally, it's just program these things, you know, the same. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, well, uh, we had a set of measurement data, but you know, uh, they didn't change over time. But we sort of became more clever over time, you know. So we were able, okay. And uh, and the amazing thing is really that you know these data were lying around, and we could extract from measurement data something by becoming more clever in time, things that we didn't know before. Uh, Yeah, you, and you will see now the following. I will show you examples where we get actually the entanglement Hamiltonian out. So we will do an entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. We learn the operator structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian, which then in this sense provides us with the parameterization of the, re of the reduced density matrix, which then allows us to do things like uh, von Neumann entropy or the entanglement spectrum. There's always the part, you know, uh, where you do um, uh, measurements. What you do is quantum post-processing. What you do is classical post-processing. 
what I described in the following is something that works if you want to ex extend these things to in future experiments for much larger systems. Uh, there's a lot of open things over here that have to do with a part of these things should be done by quantum post processing. Maybe I said the end a few words about that if you want to. Uh, so uh, it's not, you know, it's never black and white when I say that we made a lot of progress here, but not every loophole here in terms of scalability, of course, is closed. Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you right away what we wanted to do, then tell you a little story, and then show that indeed what we were hoping for is coming out, okay? So you go to the lab, and you have these beautiful experiments, and you have an XYZ chain over here, which we don't have in the lab. We have an easing model, but we can produce an approximate ground state or pro approximate excited states in the chain uh, for the Heisenberg Hamiltonian over here. And I've showed you before how we do that. For example, ground state, approximate one, variational circuit, you know, I get an approximate ground state. And you can also take this state and then sort of heat it up in an appropriate way. Again, we do that by unitary circuits to produce approximate excited states. So we can do something like that over here. This is my claim. We get approximate ground states. This is the energy spectrum of my Heisenberg model. This is the ground state over here. We don't prepare the exact ground state because um, out of these 2 to the 51, this would be pretty hard. But and we got also heated states up here. So there are superpositions in a, in a certain energy window that we can easily produce over here. Uh, by the way, when you talk about entanglement over here, uh, everybody who does uh, MPS and so on and knows many body physics knows that this is area law entanglement down here. Uh, we have volume law entanglement. Area law, of course, emerges just what, by what I mentioned earlier from the property that if you got the AK local Hamiltonian, you know, then you got uh, this is the reason why matrix product states work, uh, basically. So you might ask right away in the experiment, okay, we said we prepare ground state. Can we show that this is area law? You know, versus if I heat it up, you know, then it would be volume law. Can we see all of that scaling? Or maybe then if the, even afterwards get the complete entanglement Hamiltonian out then. And uh, the reason why we do that is this, that we got the CFT here, and you would like to, for example, go to this point delta equal to 1, but then we'll also take another one here in the gapped region, where the techniques that we apply that are borrowed from conformal th field theory don't work. But you will see somehow they work, and we can verify that there. I'll comment on that later. And the experiment that works like this, I told you before, we take some variational circuit, we get an approximate ground state, I told you the story. You know, and uh, then we have this module over here, which is for us, uh, at this point, purely classical post-processing uh, that allows us at the end to extract here the entanglement Hamiltonian. So uh, in, in this sense, by measuring the operator structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian, we do a sample efficient tomography of row A for subsystem sizes that can even be larger than 20 lattice size. This is sort of the story. So. Can we do that, and how do we do it? And in particular, you know, what's the underlying physics, what we would like to see when we do this um, sample efficient uh, Hamiltonian tomography. Uh, and uh, this is again the circuit that I showed you, where I said that, well, we got something like a superposition of the 300 lower states over here. And uh, now uh, we can ask the question, how do we learn the entanglement Hamiltonian, okay? So there's one way, which is the ultimate of uh, stupidity, that would simply be, let's do a tomography, and then let's take the logarithm, and you got the H tilde A out. If you ever try to do these things numerically even, you know, um, from the exact, uh, you need, I think, basically infinite precision if you want to do that. Uh, this is the ultimate of stupidity, and of course, we're not going to do that because we are so clever. Uh, but basically, tomography is very expensive, okay? But now the story comes in by saying that, well, uh, if you have reparameterized the density matrix like this, do we know something about the structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian? And if you know something about the structure over here, can we convert this to a good guess for the, uh, for the tomography of this density matrix over here? And of course, when I say good guess, I don't mean that you can fit, of course, a cow to a horse and vice versa. Uh, what I mean over here is this, that at the end, uh, you know, when you make an answer, so you have to verify if the answer is really correct. So there's the outcome, yes, it works, and this is the answer. No, it fails because, you know, maybe the operator structure was not part of your answer to your learning. So there's sort of the failure uh, mode also in this thing here. Uh, and this is where these things come in that I said before, we learned originally from Marcello when he was still a postdoc in Innsbruck. Uh, and uh, Marcello, together uh, with these guys here that are pretty famous in the context, I guess, of uh, having calculated all possible 
entanglement spectra for, for 1D models. I have written together with also Benoit Vermersch, who was also in Innsbruck originally, this uh, little review that's really well readable, Entanglement Hamiltonians from Field Theory to Lattice Models and Experiments, and I really recommend that you read that because that's a, that's a great uh, reading here. And I'm just taking the, the main part of the message out for the talk here. Uh, when you got the relativistic quantum field theory, uh, the so-called bisuniana wichmann theorem, that's a theorem over there, says the following. If you got the Lorentz invariant uh, theory, so this means an infinite system, you know, translation invariance and all of that, um, and uh, you go to the vacuum state over here, uh, and then you partition space, you know, into a region A and B, um, this being one axis, it's important that this is valid in all spatial dimensions, what we do over here. Then the statement of this theorem is the following, and I find it always amazing when I see that, that the reduced density matrix for the uh, vacuum state, you know, in the subregion A that you have over here, has the form of a Gibbs ensemble. You can see the Hamiltonian H over here, and this would be like a temperature, but this temperature is a local temperature. And uh, the interesting part is that this temperature over here is such that uh, the temperature here, beta is then small, is very hot near the cut, you know, and sort of cools off if you move into the bulk over here. So the amazing statement is that the reduced density matrix has the form of, uh, uh, of a Gibbs ensemble with a local temperature, you know, and intuitively, I guess it's sort of, sort of clear. I mean, you got your, uh, your cut over here, and uh, when you're close to the cut, you got entanglement across the cut, and the further you move away, this thing dies down. And this theorem tells you, independent of the Hamiltonian, and only need this uh, uh, symmetry in there, this Lorentz invariance, you know, this is always true, okay? And the deeper discussion for the, all of that can be found in these uh, papers down there. These are mathematical theorems that are proven. But of course, um, you can also do that for conformal field theory, uh, where you can even do these calculations then for the, for the bulk over here. And if you take a subregion A from the bulk, which will do in the following, then again, the same thing is true, but now you got this parabola over here. The question is now, can we adapt this thing now to, the, to a lattice model? In the lattice model, this is no longer a theorem, but you can sort of say to the extent that my lattice model over here can be described by a continuum field theory and it has these kind of properties, we would say that sim similar properties would be true. So kind of the recipe, you might call it, would be like this. If I have a local Hamiltonian, and think of this like the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, you know, you write down all of these different bits and pieces for your interaction. Uh, what this theorem proposes is this, that the entanglement Hamiltonian within the region A, over here, like that, you know, is some linear superposition of these different operator terms that you had before. So take your Hamiltonian, multiply by this beta L, which is a parabola. So uh, what this thing tells us that uh, the entanglement Hamiltonian is up to some non-universal corrections, you know, uh, basically a parabola of the original Hamiltonian. The original Hamiltonian was this individual couplings, multiply this by a parabola, you know, this is the ansatz that we should use to get the entanglement Hamiltonian out uh, for our ground state, because it's a vacuum state, ground state of our many-body system. This is sort of the guess, okay? Now we know something about it, you know, if you believe in theories, uh, and, uh, but this is not a theorem over here in this context, because this applies to lattice, so there's, uh, there's a, a lattice uh, assumption here. But you can try that, of course, on one hand uh, with analytical results that somehow show this in many cases, and there's also a lot of numerical evidence. And you can see now that we have over here then uh, this beautiful from numerics coming out, DMRG results that show these parabolic deformations that we had over here. So this is now theory at that point. Important, this is valid also in higher dimensions, okay? So uh, while we do this now in 1D, this will be also uh, valid then for the one. Okay, and now we can go back um, and look at the problem, okay? And try to understand what we sort of expect now in this case over here. So again, this is a many body system, K local, the energy spectrum over here, and this is my whole energy spectrum that I'm plotting. And uh, uh, let's take as a Hamiltonian, the Heisenberg model, that we said before, we can prepare on our machine an approximate ground state. What we want to do now is this, that we would like to prepare ground state and excited states. And I said, of course, earlier, we're not going to prepare the pure ground state, but some approximation and excited state in a certain energy window, okay, modular that. So we expect here for the ground state area law, uh, 
entanglement. So this means that the uh, Rainy entropy, for example, or also the corresponding von Neumann entropy should scale uh, with the length of the system, below subsystem size. And since this is a 1D system, we expect that this is flat area law, you know, for the ground state. But for the excited state, you know, we have here volume law entanglement. And we would expect that for the excited state, this entropy grows. Can we see that, you know? I noticed that for the ground state, of course, tensor network just rely on this fact, okay? There's for excited states, I mean, this is volume law entanglement, so uh, you're limited, you know, with your MPS stuff over here. So what will happen now? Let's make a guess now for the entanglement uh, uh, Hamiltonian that we have up here for this, for some very highly excited state. If you sort of believe in the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, this is sort of one way of telling the story, that it would simply say, we would expect that if I prepare one of these states and I cut out uh, a small subregion that the reduced density operator should be basically uh, a Gibbs ensemble, namely the Hamiltonian for your total system, you know, in the subregion A, modulo something that's happening at the edges. Okay? So the statement is simply it should be a thermal state with a fixed temperature. So our expectation is like that, that uh, the temperature, if you plot a local temperature here in a Gibbs ensemble, you would expect that the temperature should be flat over here, but the entanglement Hamiltonian should be the one of the original Hamiltonian restricted to the subregion that you have over here. And you can see that if I start increasing this thing, you know, the temperature must be the same. This curve should be flat. Uh, and the structure is the one of the entanglement. And then the outcome is, you know, some linear growth over here with the subsystem size of your von Neumann entanglement uh, entropy. What happens now in the ground state? Well, for the ground state, we have now, of course, our uh, pisoniano wichmann theorem. So it tells us this thing will have the form of a parabola. Okay? And if I start increasing my system size, it should look like that. Okay? This is the prediction. And, uh, well, since this is a CFT, there will be a logarithmic correction that comes from a central charge, which, by the way, in the experiment, we have difficulty measuring accurately, so we, we are not making this claim over here. And uh, if you move away from the critical point, it turns out that all of these things still work very well. There are certain exactly solvable models that show that it becomes sort of more triangular-like over here instead of the parabola. This is from some you know uh, papers over here uh, that uh, predict uh, some of these properties. Okay, and uh, so, now let's try to see all of that uh, by numerics. And you can see that if you do numerics, then you see the ground set indeed shows these parabolas that I was talking about. You see here, uh, uh, notice the scale over here, some logarithmic dependence. So in, from these calculations, you can extract the central charge here. If you go to the excited state, we find that indeed these things are flat modular things at the boundary for different subsystem sizes. And here's the corresponding uh, volume law. I think that's numerics, and it shows these things very beautifully. So the question is now, can we, with our approximate ground state, actually see all of that? And then ask the question, how the hell did we do it, actually? I will tell you afterwards, OK? I haven't told you the uh, technique yet, OK? Go to the lab, OK? And uh, here's, again, my slide that I showed before. We have all of these protocol, but now I can show you the results. And uh, let's see, first of all, that uh, if I go to the critical point over here, delta equal to 1, can you see here, excited state, volume law, experimental data, ground state, basically flat area law. You can try to fit the logarithm, but it turns out that the error bar there for the central charge is too big. If you go to the ground state, you can see this beautiful parabola. This is the blue curve over here. What we expect from conformal field theory at the heated state is not completely flat, but pretty flat. I mean, much more flatter than the ground state over here. So this is the conformal field theory prediction, sort of to learn the corresponding Hamiltonian. So we know now that the entanglement Hamiltonian has now the form structure of the original Heisenberg Hamiltonian multiplied by this parabola that we see. Okay? And you can go away from the critical point in this gapped region over here. Again, you can say volume and area law. And uh, if you believe your eye or not, I mean, this blue curve over here is a little bit more triangular. It's actually quite amazing that all of these techniques, you know, work quite well, even if you move away 
uh, from the critical point and uh, uh, okay uh, could have a discussion about this thing over here here's now something where we do that for much larger system sizes going up to I don't know uh, typically 20 sizes, and uh, the fitting of all of that becomes then more and more complicated than learning the entanglement structure of the Hamiltonian. But I really want to emphasize that we are learning here the complete reduced density operator by learning the operator structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian. And the entanglement Hamiltonian has the polynomial number of coefficients that we have to learn uh, scaling with the system size. Okay, So this makes it sample efficient. So we can do a sample efficient Hamiltonian tomography uh, based on the fact that uh, we know sort of the structure uh, of the Hamiltonian and then we can also try and if you want I can elaborate a little bit more on that we can then do uh, oops, uh, some verification uh, over here and, and uh, do this uh, fidelity. I sort of sense that you are getting a little bit tired here uh, should we come slowly to an end? I have another little part over here, just a few more slides. Maybe I'll wake you up at the end again. How we actually do all of that, and it's more like a sum of recipes, how we do that, that has um, sort of written up in this Nature Physics paper before. So I'll go over this thing very quickly. And these are the main papers that I would like to refer to over here. So randomized measurement tomography sort of works like this, that if you apply over here random uh, unitaries, you get here these probabilities out and allows you to reconstruct this thing here. And we had uh, tomography that we said was very expensive and now comes the part how we actually do that. Uh, we make take data and we want to learn the structure of this Hamiltonian over here which is nothing else but the deformation of the system Hamiltonian. So this is our operator ansatz and we want to learn this polynomial number of coefficients over here. So we only scaling with the system size, don't have an exponential scaling, but we only have a linear scaling over here, believing that, and we want to test for additional terms that are over here. So it works like this, that we have our data, we design an ansatz, we construct that, and then we can uh, sort of fit this thing over here, and then we can compare with more data, and this compare with more data, it's like the verification protocol of different simulators I indicated before, so you can test to what extent all of these things are valid. This is sort of the shortcut, and if you want to see the formulas behind that, you know, this is uh, basically how we do that, these are these probabilities, this is the ansatz, and this is this optimal fitting where you try to make your exponential with your ansatz most compatible with all of the possible data that you have. Okay? And then you can do this, this verification. Okay. Uh, here's an example. Okay, just one more thing that you can also take the original uh, Hamiltonian over here from the Ising model and do some simulations over here. I just want to show you one plot because you might ask, how many runs does it take? Okay, an experimentalist care very much how many experiments they do because this has to do with the, you know, uh, how long it takes for a PhD to, to finish. Okay, so that's sometimes important, in some cases maybe not. Uh, and uh, you can see here that um, how many, um, uh, with the system size that they have over here, how many measurements does it take to do an entanglement Hamiltonian tomography so that the fidelity that I get is larger than 98%. And then you have different things competing. Here is our entanglement Hamiltonian tomography, which is basically flat, so it scales really uh, with increasing the system size. You know, don't need many more measurements. Actually, the number of measurements here is pretty friendly. If you take something like uh, projected least square tomography or a finite rank, they all scale, you know, pretty much exponentially. And once an experimentalist sees 10 to the 8 uh, runs and so on, then it gets scary, okay? So you can see that we're doing well here on this scaling, okay? So this means that these techniques, uh, while ultimately, you know, they will be not uh, uh, sort of, you know, it gets more and more complicated the more the system size grows, but uh, we are very optimistic that using these techniques we can go into a regime of quantum advantage and apply all of these protocols, including also higher spatial dimensions. Okay, so I think that sort of lays out a possible path to get um, a handle on measuring entanglement in many body systems in the way that I outlined, and uh, doing it for 2D is uh, interesting, and uh, this then sort of takes me to the end of my story. 
which is here, you've seen now real life programmable quantum simulators with atoms. And uh, we have talked about hybrid classical quantum algorithms that we run to produce the proximal ground states and the randomized measurement toolbox. And these were these uh, results over here. And uh, just on the side, the remark that I've sort of a talk in my pocket where we apply similar ideas to build this is completely different story, you know, uh, programmable quantum sensors where you run a quantum machine to act as an interferometer, but you ask the quantum simulator, you know, to produce the best possible entangled state and the best possible measurements uh, that you can do on the system that are entangled in order to optimize, say, the signal to noise ratio. Okay, so the machine finds itself and it's using the resources of the entanglement resources of a programmable quantum simulator. That's a completely different application, but it's sort of relying on a very similar kind of toolbox and ideas. Okay, I can see that all of you are tired, so uh, these are the people that really deserve the credit. Christian Cockrell was a theorist that did all of the theoretical uh, preparation and, and uh, you know, up to the point of programming even the, the experimental machine, together with uh, Manoj Josie, who is the experimentalist on the side over here. Rick van Beinen was responsible for all of these protocols uh, that we had about state preparation uh, and, and so on. You know, this is uh, on the machine doing the optimization. And Thorsten Sacher was our high energy physicist who knows a lot about entanglement, Hamiltonian, and quantum field theories. and. Uh, Christian Roos uh, was sort of the senior in the experimental lab, and this is uh, Rainer Blatt over here. Okay, with this, let me thank you for listening to all of that. Uh, okay, so how to do this thing globally, yeah? I mean, uh, our very first paper that we wrote together with Benoit uh, and, and also Andreas Elvin, uh, we did an analysis for uh, generating global unitaries, you know, and it was based on the fact that we said that, well, let's take a Hubbard model in two dimensions, like what the experimentalists have, Hubbard models, but uh, we can always, uh, you know, modulate this Hamiltonian in a way, like have local offsets and, uh, you know, there's certain parameters. Uh, so how many of these uh, modulations or sort of random uh, does it take when we do one after the other, like uh, uh, in order to have something like, like a two design emerging and so on. And uh, we quantified all of that, but it was more along the line of numerical experiments and so on. And uh, in the meantime, there have been other papers thinking about, I guess, uh, similar or related things. Uh, over here, uh, I would say our friends are so happy with these local measurements that they don't want to go away from it. But uh, if you, uh, I'm very eager to see something like that actually happening in the, in the lab or being used. And uh, um, I find that the zero order idea that we had, you know, let's do random quenches and let's see that there are two design and verify that. The only, of course, are two designs or three design or whatever, you know, up to a certain order. Uh, I think that's, I find this very interesting. So I'm excited about it, but I have difficulty convincing my experimental friends that it is, because if something works in the experiments, for some reason they don't want to change that, you know? Okay, uh, I'm not sure I understand, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, I don't remember now the details, but the global ones were sort of more efficient uh, in this case over here, so it's something preferable. Uh, and I mean, there have been some papers about it. Uh, forgot the details now. No, but it was uh, so it's clear that, I mean, if you can do uh, global random unitaries, you know, it would be great. But you have to certify them, you know, I mean, how, how do you do that? Eh? And uh, then you have to show the two design properties in an experiment and then based on this, you know, verification up to a certain error bar, then you have to, uh, then you have to see how this, propag uh, how this propagates in your error analysis. So uh, uh, the, the local random unit are, you know, they can do this very accurately. So if this works, so where, for example, the, the local ones do not work in the way that I described it over here would be the case of the Hubbard model. Uh, because in a Hubbard model, you know, when I uh, make local random unitaries, so what, what does it mean? You know, you are violating the particle number there if you want to do that, you know. And so you always have to take then sort of pairs, you know, maybe larger cells here together and then apply it there. 
and uh, there have been papers along these lines uh, analyzing these things uh, recently. So in some cases, you can sort of go in between global and the local, and uh, just in the case of Harvard models, you have to do these things uh, anyway. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying, what is our verification step? Okay, so I had a slide over here. We can actually go back to that. So this was this, uh, you know, uh, you take a certain subsystem size over here, and uh, from this, you from data, you learn here these coefficients beta uh, j over here, and then you take some extra data, and then what you're trying to do here is this, that you're trying to compare the density matrix. You know, you're asking, is my density matrix that I now sort of know uh, with my entanglement Hamiltonian that I just measured, what is the overlap with the density matrix, you know, from the new data which I get? Okay, and I said before that the protocol sort of allows one to do that. And uh, this is now this comparison of these uh, corresponding fidelities. For the ground states, that's basically one over here, it's really put. And for the heated state, you know, for, uh, this is, you know, for different subsystem sizes, uh, this is, okay, 95% uh, or something like that, okay? Um, if this was down here and the fidelity was very low, then we would know that it's completely wrong. And the idea is now, of course, that you increase your ansatz, you know, that this fidelity gets better. In the case of the experiment, we very often, if we try to measure small corrections, you know, we cannot do that over here, then you're drowning in noise and maybe you need more measurements, but there may be other problems that are wrong. So we could sort of uh, see over here very clearly the spisoniano wichmann structure, conformal field of this parabola. Okay, if you ask us, could we see higher order terms? We are sure that they are there, you know, but uh, they cannot be seen in the experiment and even extracting them on the theory side and there's some missing theory over here, you know. I'd love to see somebody from the conformal field theory community sit down and work out, you know, these higher order corrections for these lattice models here and uh, sort of then to make a more systematic search for that. You know? Yeah. But this is, I guess, an essential point what you bring up, yeah. yeah. They say what? Not, not. You're saying that the experiment has to be done many times. Sorry, this was the number of measurements that was uh, that was plotted uh, over here. This is what I what I meant by that. You know, what the experimentalists care about is how often they have to measure because you know for reasons that we indicated before. You know. Where's this thing now? Okay, here it was. Oh, okay. See, down here was the number of measurements. Uh, uh, see, okay, no, this was the subsystem size and this was the number of total experimental runs. And the number of total experimental runs means that I pick a certain unitary, I repeat it then uh, NU times, and then I repeat, you know, uh, then I, in each, for each unitary I have a loop, sort of, you know, that it takes measurement to get rid of the noise. So. Uh, Nm times Nu is really the total number of experimental runs that you have to do in your system, okay? That's right, each time, that's right. So on an iron trap, this is, uh, I mean, I have to say that the simulation time itself is very short, you know, so the actual running of the quantum simulator, but the preparation uh, sort of in every step, you know, to recool and, and all of these things, and it's about for the trapped ions, 0.03 seconds, what I remember. And, and also measurements take some time. So the actual running of the algorithm is very short, you know, and you could save maybe a lot of time sort of in between. And uh, the main problem, for example, for cold gas experiments like Hubbard models is, is the repetition time, you know. So if you got the device like superconducting, you know, the Google group has used now these ideas, 
that we outlined here very frequently, actually, and, and their techniques and measured rainy entropies like that. Uh, for them, it's ideal because they have a lot of repetitions. You know, superconducting qubits are very fast. Okay, and so for them, these things are ideal. Uh, uh, but for some atomic systems, they're very slow, and then this is a problem. I can, with very high fidelity, because uh, uh, yes, I mean you know uh, preparing. You know what you do here is this: that initially you prepare a product set, so you just go to every atom and you do optical pumping. You know that prepares really with very high fidelity. Uh, a pure state, and then you can rotate it to the initial condition that you want. So uh, this is sort of the least worry, I would say, in this context over here. But you're right, in principle, there's an error, but I'm saying it's small relative to a lot of other problems that are around. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, this is not an experiment here. You know, this is us theorists sitting down and taking some random numbers here and then you know looking at the scaling here you know okay, so this is not uh, this is theory the experiment it was 1.2 yeah yes okay yeah paper by alexa goshkov yeah Uh, yeah. But I think that, you know, here, I don't know why Christian Kokel picked this 2.5 here, uh, but uh, so f this works also well for these other parameters. You know, these papers were written uh, quite some time before the experiment happened. Okay, so these were the theoretical preparation. And you can see that we took here the original Hamiltonian from the Ising model that we wanted to do. It was not the Heisenberg model here. But the experimentalists have difficulty implementing this thing directly, even though I told you, you know, that they implement that. Uh, it is not super stable in this form, and they like to operate in the domain where B is large, and therefore you reduce this Hamiltonian to this uh, flip-flop Hamiltonian sigma plus sigma minus, okay, uh, which was underlying our circuits. So they were complaining to do that directly in the lab like this, because the coherence here turns out to be larger as in the other cases that we had, but take this as technical at the moment. And this was what for, for Yes, okay. Yeah. But 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 don't I mean don't confuse two things. I mean what we did uh, when I showed you the experimental results was that they had a resource Hamiltonian that was the easing Hamiltonian was part of the variational circuits, but we were optimizing a state which was the ground state of the Heisenberg model. Don't confuse these two. There's a uh, you know we wanted to find the ground state of the Heisenberg model using this kind of Hamiltonian over here as a resource in our variational algorithm to get it. These are completely different things. One was the quantum resource, and the other one was the ground state of the Heisenberg model. The Heisenberg model in these experiments never exists in the lab in terms of a Hamiltonian. We only produce a quantum state approximately that corresponds to the Hamiltonian that we have written on a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah, this was for the Heisenberg model. That was for Heisenberg. This was for Heisenberg using this thing as a resource, but forget about the resource, you know, let's talk about Heisenberg per se. And if you did a good job, and I told you, I think we did a good job, you know, uh, let's look at the entanglement properties to show the area law. So don't confuse the two things. Yes, in the, in the, in the Heisenberg, there's no alpha. The alpha shows up in the resource, and there the large alpha is very important because it turns out, if you go through the details, why does this very short circuit work so well? It's related to the fact that this uh, Ising Hamiltonian with long-range interaction, alpha 1.2, creates long-range entanglement on this single action 
of a Hamiltonian. And it is this long-range entanglement generated by the long-range interaction uh, that is essential for this uh, circuit in the variational quantum algorithm to converge relatively fast. Okay? There's a lot of technical things in here, but don't confuse the Heisenberg with the resource. Okay? These are different things. You know? But uh, a good question. Okay. Uh, Well, if you ask me, you know, if I give a public talk and say whatever, I have to be honest, you know, uh, there's always a match between the Hamiltonian where these things work well because you want a short depth circuit. So there's a little dirty uh, secrets behind it when these you find matching pairs. I can tell you that the choice of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian here was not random. It was dictated that we wanted a conformal field theory, but it was also dictated by the fact that uh, we yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, uh, that's right. So it's not too dissimilar. That's right. Okay. So that's a usual thing in physics, right? Yeah, usual. But it's a usual thing in physics. So that's right. So there's there's uh, no real miracle, but only little ones. You know. <laughs> okay. Very good. So I think I really made you tired now, or so.